Welcome to The X-Files, a special edition podcast from Full Prefrontal. We love stories because they take us to the secret hidden places where we store the essence of real living. Only through stories do we witness extraordinary moments of human resilience. In these special edition episodes, we hear the stories of former clients, learning about their gifts, challenges, aspirations, letdowns, and inner activism. The clients presented in The X-Files have helped Sucheta become a better listener, observer, problem solver, and above all, a caring clinician. She hopes these stories will melt your heart and help you see executive function in a new light. And now, here is our host, Sucheta Kamath. So Todd, you know I love my work. Uh, One of the perks of being in this profession is to meet interesting people and get to help people who otherwise you will never meet. And today we have a very special guest. I not only know him and have gotten to know him over a long period of time, but I also know his family. And he is the nicest young man. And I hope you can hear in our interview how we both have cherished our relationship and I particularly have found his talents and artistic acumen uh, really very uh, heartwarming. And in fact, in my office, if you ever come, you will see a collection of his art pieces. So I bring you Trevor Belmont. He was a client of mine, and I think you will soon understand why his story is an important one for everyone to hear. So Trevor, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here. So let me get started with my questions. What made you seek help? Did the issues that you were dealing with, were they impacting many parts of your life? And can you share with us what were those issues when you began to kind of struggle? All right. Well, I have to admit that uh, what made me seek help was uh, my first semester of uh, undergraduate college. This was around 2005 or so. I was down at a college, uh, Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida, and uh, I did terribly. I was failing. I had always had trouble in the past. I had been diagnosed early with some of the issues I have. So it's the I knew I had issues. I just wasn't prepared for how big of an impact they were going to be once I was out on my own. And they impacted a lot. I mean, work-related, things like turning in assignments, remember. It's remembering to get to class, but also just, you know, interacting with people. I was a, not the most social person. Trevor, when you went to Eckerd, you must have gone with great hope and anticipation of freedom and autonomy. And there was a great sense of excitement when you arrived on campus. Were these kind of concerns that eventually ended your uh, Eckerd's career, so to speak, were they on top of your mind at that time? Not really, no. I had signed up to get disability services, but then again, I forgot to go in in for half of the first year. So I had the help lined up, but did not actually start it. So that was obviously an issue, but um, it really wasn't on my mind. My mind was on, you know, going to class, being free, being independent, showing everybody that I could be on my own. And why particularly did you choose Eckerd College? At the time, I was very interested in marine biology. I still am to an extent, but I've actually switched focus first to general biology and now to teaching biology as what I want to do with my life. But um, Eckerd College has a very good marine biology program, and that was what I was interested in. One of the best in the country. I'm pretty, pretty sure, at least it was at the time I was going there. Let's backtrack a little bit. How young were you when you first got diagnosed with the learning disabilities? And uh, when did did these learning problems begin to interfere with your academic performance? It was actually the fact that they were interfering with my academic performance that started bringing them them, um, into focus. The first thing I was diagnosed with was attention deficit disorder, which I think is now called ADHD inattentive type. That was in third grade. And the reason why my teachers asked my parents to get me tested was because during in-class assignments, I would literally just stop whatever I was doing, grab a book off the shelf, and start reading. Got it. So obviously, there was some sort of disconnect there. And what was the teacher's complaint about it? It was actually just that a, you know, 
great kid, you know, obviously learning and whatnot, but not focusing properly on the task that he was supposed to be focusing on. And not doing what he's supposed to do in the class, cooperate and engage in activities, right? So you're not kind of disrupting the class in any well, ways. But this wasn't really during cooperative work. This was when, you know, everybody was doing silent work at their desks. So I probably was a little bit disruptive, but I was generally sat near the bookshelves anyways. So, you know. So how did that diagnosis lead to you getting the help at that time? At the time, they set me up with a psychiatrist. I can't remember if the psychiatrist, if they just had me on drugs at first or if they actually had psychiatric meetings that early. But uh, the first psychiatrist I remember is Dr. Elaine Mateo, who uh, helped me pretty much through when I started undergrad and had to get a new psychiatrist just once uh, they after I came back home from undergrad, but uh, that's a whole another story. And uh, she was the one that diagnosed me with ADHD. She was the first person to mention Asperger's, although she never actually officially diagnosed me with it. And uh, she was also the one who diagnosed me with chronic depression, which has contributed to my uh, problems in its own special way throughout the years. So is chronic a diagnosis? I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, but let's focus uh, a little bit longer on ADHD. So let's say you not staying on task was a very kind of a telling sign when you were younger, but then you received some help, which is medication, I'm, I suppose, yeah. right? Because you didn't come to me uh, when you were in third grade. Nope. So what kind of... Uh, <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> what kind of things did the medication do to your uh, ability to focus as well as engage? Did that improve your studying skills? To be honest, I am still uncertain myself. People around me told me it was helping me focus, but it, it's the, I have never had the best internal lens towards my focus. So it's the, half the time I can't tell if the medicine's working or not. I will say I went through a entire smorgasbord of different medications early on because uh, I kept popping up with some of the weird side effects like uh, some of the early ones, I managed to get uh, increased aggressive tendencies, which led to his own lovely set of issues in school. But um, others suppressed appetite and just generally we had trouble finding one that both helped me and did not cause some other issue to crop up. And that's really complicated matter, right? Oh, yes. Anything that is dealing with brain chemistry is going to have complications pretty much. So meanwhile, uh, your learning did not stop. So that means you continued your schooling. But tell me a little bit about your actual learning abilities, like listening to the class lecture, for example, or or taking notes or uh, go, doing assignments at home on your own or completing homework or working on projects. And I'm talking more middle school and high school. Yeah. How was that? As I got older, the attention issues, especially things like completing assignments on time started to become more of a a problem, especially once long-term projects got in there. Uh, I did have some help over the years. A Richard Kaplan was somebody that uh, my parents actually took me to see to help with just organization and writing. And he helped me for a number of years, but it, it was always things sort of treating the surface symptoms, not the underlying causes. But by the time I got to high school, I was functional, but not really on top. And I definitely needed oversight still. Got it. And how did this oversight, uh, once you became a teenager, um, how did this oversight feel to you? It was disappointing, I think, is the uh, main term I would come to. I, I felt like I shouldn't need to have this. And I, I did not really lash out myself that much during my early teenage years. But um, I definitely I was moody, I think, was would be the best term. It's, I didn't really like that I had to have help and I would occasionally verbally lash out, but that was generally as far as it went. So by the time I saw you, you were quite resistant and difficult. I, I don't mean as a person, but I think your relationship to your own difficulties had come to head. And what kind of led in that direction, you think? I think part of it was finally getting on my own out, off at college and then failing like I did. It's the, it dredged up a lot of the negative emotions, including ones that I had sort of suppressed because, you know, I realized I had issues. I realized that, you know, I needed help, but it, it's the, 
I started to resent the fact that I needed help. And I started to resent the fact that I was getting help because I've, I have long been a very prideful person, but um, it was difficult to admit that I could not solve things on my own. And the, uh, the and still when I, the uh, first time I visited you, it wasn't even my idea. It was my parents' idea. And I was, I was a jerk. I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. I was angry and lashing out at everything. Yeah, you were very difficult. <laughs> and you almost uh, directed that anger towards me as if I was the bearer of the bad news. So I must be a, the most evil person to be hated. And I, I don't agree. I directed it at everyone. Let's be honest. It's <laughs> my parents, myself. I'm sure my brother managed to get some in there, even though he was already off at college doing his own thing a couple states away. Got it. So it's so, so interesting. I want you to talk a little bit about that because I think there are a lot of parents who are struggling with this, their own, particularly teenage children, that they need help. But those very people who need to help are being pushed away or they are resisted or they are protested against. And so how can you help somebody who doesn't want the help? I, my parents just sort of forced me to do it. And it, it but um, it can be hard. I know my own progress with dealing with my issues went a lot slower than it could have because I was pretty much resisting tooth and nail any sort of uh, suggestions given. Thank you for mentioning that. I think uh, my experience, Andrew, working for the last 20 years, that people who come to me because they want change, but they once they realize what goes into making that change, they start you know backtracking and they're resistant or they kind of don't like this anymore. Well, it's one thing to talk about change and how you know change is going to be good for you, but then it's another thing to realize you are fundamentally altering an aspect of who you are, even if it's a minor aspect. And there is fear there. Change is a very scary thing, especially personal change of this level. And anger is one of the easiest ways to ward off any anybody coming towards you with a you know yeah. shake of a hand or um, with a with kind of a, a promise of a better future. It's the if you attack people first, they know they don't have a chance to attack you. Basically, that brings me to this question: that your relationship to advocacy. So sounds like in middle school and high school, and I'm I'm. I'm uh, ignoring the elementary years because you were young enough and not probably mature, um, uh, you know. Or oh, aware. I didn't understand at all. Yeah, I, you didn't understand that. I, my my understanding basically amounted to here's a pill, take it every day, and it'll help you. Got it. So nobody really educated you about why and how uh, of the impact that these things could have. They might have tried, but it, if they did, it didn't really register. register with my brain. It was more just a something wasn't right. This is how you solve it. Therefore, this is what we're doing. Got it. So in middle school and high school, can you describe a little bit more about your difficulties, not just academic, but the social ones? And how did that all collectively impact you, you as a learner and your interest and motivation? Yeah. Social issues were the big thing in middle school, especially. I was not popular. I kept to myself a lot. I had a few friends, but um, there were... I mean, I was not bullied by any means, but I was particularly sensitive towards jokes or taunts directed to me. And um, for uh, several years, I would try and lash out at that. That was in no small part exacerbated by the medication I was on at the time, which was the one that ended up being causing the uh, anger issues. But um there was actually a point where I was uh, called it in to talk with the uh, principal about things. And uh, luckily, they were very understanding about the fact that, you know, I wasn't starting things necessarily. I was just the first person getting physical. You were very reactionary. Oh, yeah. And uh, you were not responding, but you're reacting. And that's all. Yeah. Never, it's never a good good news. It is not. It's the, How did um, you get in trouble with that? Because it's the... People don't really tend to notice when kids are taunting other kids verbally, but when what one of the other kids starts trying to attack another kid, and it's the anger issues were definitely a problem. And it's the uh, one incident in particular that I remember was uh, in a classroom. I want to say this was seventh grade. 
I was doing something with my notebook. I don't even remember what anymore. And uh, one of the other kids in class came up behind me and I don't even remember what he said. I don't remember what it was, you know, if I was already primed or anything. I just remember one minute I am, you know, doodling on my notebook or something. And the next minute I am seeing nothing but red and I have my hands around this kid's throat. Really? Oh, yeah. And I was not even conscious of the change until after it had happened. That was a little bit frightening, to be honest. The um, the fact that I could react that quickly and without even knowing I was reacting. So you kind of were choking him? Oh, well, there was no kind of about it. I had my kid. I was literally choking the kid. When did you come to your senses or what happened? Were you taken to the principals? And It was shortly after that that the... It, whole discussion with the principal happened and it's the um they it was i do believe shortly after that i was switched off of the medication i was currently on into a different one which helped matters some i still occasionally have temper issues in fact my current psychologist refers to me as the world's largest bomb on the world's longest fuse (laughs) i like that (laughs) not i don't like that for you but i I mean it's the uh it's a very good description and it's the it takes a lot to set me off these days but it's not the prettiest when it does happen i think what's interesting about this is that this is a wonderful thing for the listeners to kind of take away that there is a way to really extend uh, that fuse on a bomb that we know exists oh yeah it's the the therapy that can do that yeah right it's Therapy definitely helped with that. Um, Dr. Mateo did help me through those years quite a bit. And I, you know, do I still occasionally have anger problems? Yes, I probably will till the day I die. It's sort of, it's a part of me, but it's a part I've come to accept. But it's the, I've accepted that I will always have this issue. The thing that I, I always try to work on is, okay, how can we prevent this issue from coming to bear quite so often? So Trevor... I have explained this to you many times about executive function or executive dysfunction, that there's a, these are supervisory skills. They supervise how you regulate your thinking, your actions, and your emotions. And so uh, the not being able to regulate your anger can become a problem by itself. But once a young man is angry, then the focus is on dealing with that. But as you have said, anything that's underlying that anger never gets enough attention. And in your case, what I know is, you know, being frustrated, not being able to effectively show you you have understood, understood something or not having done the homework makes you, uh, they, uh, you know, somebody assigning that work again and again, but the work is so boring. So now you're doing it the fourth time, but incomplete, and that can make you very, very angry. But the goal of life is to really manage emotions as much as you're managing your goals and your future, so to speak. So that brings me to this question about the encounter with me. When did you first understand the term executive function or executive (laughs) dysfunction? The first time I heard that was actually my first meeting with you. I had never heard of the term executive function before. I had never heard of the term executive dysfunction before. And it was enlightening, to say the least, that, you know, yes, I had these other issues like ADD and depression and whatnot, but that there was another issue that I had all along that was, you know, a major cause of most of my problems that was just being sort of left there untreated was, I'm not even sure the word, it wasn't really upsetting so much as like, how could, why did we not catch this before? Frustrating is the good word for it, actually. There are times I wonder, had this actually been caught, say, in middle school or even high school, would I have had nearly as many problems as I ended up having? Oh, my. You know, it would have been so much better if it was um, identified, treated, and supported. You would have yeah. definitely had had different experience, I can tell. I think what's so interesting to me that you were diagnosed with ADHD, but nobody really uh, explained the fundamental cognitive profile of a person with ADHD is executive dysfunction. Uh, the most I ever got was just hard to focus. Yeah, no, no. And so tell us a little bit, what have you come to understand what executive functions mean? And what have I explained to you that has stuck? (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, it's the uh, one thing that all, always stuck with me was um, you mentioned at one point three different types of memory, and I can never remember the names of the types of memory. I just remember the first is remembering you have a wife. The second is remembering your wife's birthday. And the third, which is the one that executive function messes with, is remembering to pick up the birthday present for the birthday before the birthday actually happens. Of your wife. <laughs> so remembering you have a wife and remembering she has a specific day as her birthday is not a problem. But remember that day is today. It's yeah. Certainly executive function. It's the time is, you know, everybody talks about how nebulous time is. And it's half the time I want to say, no, most of you have no idea how nebulous time is because for you, it's an abstract concept. For me, it is non-existent. Like the past exists, present exists. The future is just a nebulous cloud that I cannot comprehend. And I think this is uh, hopefully uh, really where our work focus has focused on and has given you some relief because a lot of work that we talk about is goal orientedness. How do I think yeah. about my future me? Right. Can you tell us a little bit about that? One of the things that has really helped me is the idea of using a calendar, especially the calendar on smartphones these days, which God bless those and uh, setting alarms and, and appointments in the phone to give me reminders close to both when it's due and also like, for instance, with a long term project, splitting it up into chunks and then setting, do, you know, alarms, you know, we'll be working on this by this point. So listeners, don't be fooled by his clarity and, and uh, very, very succinct way of describing this strategy. <laughs> Can, do you mind telling us what it has taken to get you to think about those things? You were so resistant to using any tools oh, yeah. for managing your time. Well, like I said, especially I was due to the anger I had at first. I was very adamant about not actually following through with anything. It's the, you gave me planners that I rarely used. You, you know, who tried to get me to set alarms and things and I wouldn't do it. It's, it took me a long while to get over myself really and actually start using the tools that you were offering. And do you have a better understanding of that you that is so resistant and that I see it as a lack of insight and lack of uh, deep knowledge of executive function, but also the very skills that get, go into seeing yourself from a third person's point of view is impaired or is it problematic for those with executive function problems? Yeah. <laughs> it also doesn't help that uh, for a long time and even now, if you tell me to do something, explain why it's going to help. And for a lot of that, it's like, you could explain it, but I wouldn't understand the explanation because I wouldn't understand the explanation. The foundation of yeah, the explanation. Like, I could not actually comprehend what the explanation was. So it's like, yes, you could explain it, but that ex explanation isn't going to do anything for me. And it's just going to make me even more frustrated. And, you know, once again, start refusing to do it because I haven't been, had it properly explained to me yet. So one thing that um, I'm going to uh, kind of talk about that one of the therapy goals has been conceptualizing goals, immediate goals, intermediate goals, and future goals. And one concept that I have talked to you about, which is higher goal trumps lower goal. And for example, if you are sitting and working on a project and you see that your cat just came into the room and you want the cat to go out and then the, then you take the cat out and then you realize that, you know, maybe she is hungry so that you suddenly decide to check whether there is enough food. So now what you're doing is this cat, the goal was to really get the cat out so that you can pursue the higher goal, which is the completing the studying. Now, the lower goal is what you begin to pursue. Yeah. And that needs to happen a lot with you. And so we have worked a lot with that. Can you explain what the process has been and how do you use this process? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm not even sure if I even really un understand the process so much as just started doing it instinctively. But um, it's a lot of it is just every so often when I'm doing something, especially if something else comes along, stop, you know, just stop. Think which of these is more important and try and keep going on the one that is more important. 
does it always work? No. Sometimes it's that little thing that in the back of your mind that keeps nagging you and you have to actually stop what you're doing, do whatever the little thing was just so that it's no longer there or distracting you. But so you, would you describe yourself as less distracted person? Not really less distracted, but less prone to actually give in to the distractions. That's a great way to describe that. Change. Because it, it's not that I'm necessarily harder to distract anymore. It's more that I can actually comprehend, okay, this is going on, but it's a distraction. I need to keep my focus turned this way. So tell me a little bit about the work that you, we ha- you and I have done with social skills. I don't think you yourself realized how many challenges you had in that area. Do you feel you have a better understanding of your social skills problems? Definitely. It's a... Uh... I will say I probably didn't really comprehend how much of an issue I had with social skills. It's the part of that is I am somewhat introverted and only really want or need a small group of friends in the first place. I'm not the sort of person to really be outgoing. And it's like I will go to, say, Dragon Con or other conventions of that type. But it's I have fun in spite of the crowds, not because of the crowds. Part of that is that I have always had difficulty reading emotions on people, whether that's verbally or non-verbally. Tone of voice was something that I took as most of my cue for what somebody was feeling. And even then, it's like there are people who will have the same tone of voice for two different feelings. So it's like, okay, are you angry or are you just tired right now? Got it. So you just didn't have a range, a a way to detect the range or language to describe it or capture that. Yeah, it's nonverbal language, especially just didn't really register that much. A bit of facial expression, because I mean, that is the most obvious nonverbal language. But can you tell the listeners what kind of work we did that really has focused on developing and polishing these social skills abilities? And if you can recall all of them, I can help as well. Honestly, the thing I recall the most was the uh, group therapies that we did and, you know, just meeting with people in a less formal setting. Like we had several lunches together. And so I went on that one dinner date with a lovely young lady. Got it. And then we also have gone to movies. We have done outings or holiday uh, get togethers. Part of my job, or rather the way I conceptualize the real work happens where the real need is. And when you are in the social context, it is really helpful for me to see what you do or what you fail to do or what you're not doing enough. You have seen Sucheta follow you with a video camera. (laughs) (laughs) And you remember one one time we were in a Thai restaurant and I video recorded because another group member was really out of line. Oh, yeah. (laughs) You remember that? Do not remember the young man's name and would not say it on air anyways. But um, he was a lot like I was when I started out. His issues were very different than mine, I recall, but um, he was very antagonistic and abrasive are the best two words. And that was me when I started out. I was very much, I would turtle into my own little shell and nobody else could get get in here and do anything. But um, he had a breakdown there in the restaurant and uh, it was not pretty. That was really strange. Well, it's I and one of the others has tried to actually diffuse the situation. And he was too far gone at that point. It's attempts to calm down just ended up making things explode that much harder. What was interesting is you now, Trevor, have become the champion in a social situation where you become the hostage negotiator, so to speak. (laughs) (laughs) And you are the one who is most pragmatic and trying to show perspective to each side. It's quite the sight, I must say. It's definitely, you know, I'm honestly amazed that sometimes that I've gotten to this point, but it's part of it ties into why I want to be a teacher is that, you know, I have a decent gift for actually helping people. And I like exercising it. And it's the, I had been in this young man's place before, but not even really ideas so much as emotions were going through his head at that point. So it's the, 
I understood, you know, wh where he was coming from, why he felt so frustrated. I had to actually stop and calm myself down after a, a few uh, instances of um, abrasiveness. Another example comes to my mind is we have done a lot of work on taking perspectives of others as a as a specific skill, uh, as an executive function, which is mental flexibility, also emotional control, also kind of seeing a shared goal. What my goal is not more important than other people's goals, but how can I promote other people achieve their goals while I'm achieving mine? And we have done a lot of work in that area about planning a gift or thinking a little bit ahead or having a perspective how to support your friends when they're going through hardship. And you have done incredible progress. Do you want to share with people in what ways all these skills that you have developed is helping you with your life? Well, it helping me empathize with people more, which always helps in the whole, you know, friends category. But um, one of my friends went through a recent hardship and uh, he's doing OK, but um, he lost a family pet. And I've been there. Several of our other friends have been there. I'm pretty sure he's been there before. It's never easy. And this one in particular sort of came out of nowhere and blind. So, well, not nowhere. They knew who the uh, animal was getting fairly poor in health, but it, it's the, he was concentrating on other things and thought it was still a ways off and uh, learning that it was happening that quickly blindsided him. And you were there for him. I tried to be. Whether I was successful or not, you know, I can't really say A entirely, but I tried to be there for him just as he would have been there for me in a similar situation. So, Trevor, tell us a little bit about your anxiety disorder. You were recently diagnosed with that, rather in your journey of this, uh, um, you know, ADHD followed by um, Asperger's or not, and then this, uh, depression. But anxiety came along uh, as a diagnosis much later. How does this fit with your own understanding of all the things that you struggled with? And that must have made life quite complicated. Well, it's... I always knew that stress tended to make me shut down. It's um, I never really thrived on stress the way other people were. My mother especially tends to work harder under stress just because she she claims it's because she shuts down as well from stress and that that motivates her to you know work better so that she doesn't shut down. I have never seen it, so I can't really comment on that. But um, when I most recently got officially retested so that I could get disability services in graduate school, the study came back that uh, not only did I have, you know, depression, ADHD, and it never, nobody has ever actually said outright that I have Asperger's, just I show signs of Asperger's. So I'm not sure, do I have it or do I just have signs that I might have it? But that was there. And also, it's not just stress. I apparently do actually have full-blown anxiety, which, you know, makes some sense because I, when things get bad, I shut down. It's do not pass go, do not collect $200. I am in the fetal position in the corner, rocking back and forth, wondering what went wrong. And that uh, you are learning to manage that as well in all this. Uh, so it's really been a, quite, a, quite the journey, I must say. Uh, yeah. And uh, what's so impressive, and it's such a joy to work with you, Trevor, because what's so impressive and heartwarming for me is you're a very talented young man and you have so many gifts. You're a kind, kind, kind person. You're incredibly creative, brilliant when it comes to explaining science and biology and your passion. I just can't wait when it gets rightfully channeled. And you are truly a great mentor and, and a kind, supportive human being. So I, I really see you as an educator supporting all these children who are probably showing signs like that you did at that, that age. And I can see you handling them with great compassion and care. And I'm extremely op optimistic about uh, that working out for you. What do you think? I certainly hope it works out for me. And so I keep, I think the one thing I can tell people is never give up hope. It's the, well, that and don't let pride get in your way because that's definitely been one of my biggest issues. So um, relent on the pride, reach out to people, 
get the help you need. Acknowledge that there is a problem, and, but remember that problems can be fixed. I love There's that. no problem that really can't be fixed and never give up hope that you will get there. You know, I almost casually mentioned that I, I have chronic depression. That's been a that's actually more serious than I really have been uh, talking about. The, that's a whole another conversation. But um, one thing that has always kept me going is that things can get better. No matter how bleak it seems, no matter how down you get, things can get better if you let them and if you work for it. So as we come to towards the end of our discussion, tell me a little bit about Suchetaisms or any funny stories that you remember about our work or anything that's very peculiar. Like she has an unusual way of doing things. Oh, uh, well, you, you found the co whole concept of the micro shield that I had for CPR far too entertaining. And I never really understood that. Do you want to tell people that? It, <laughs> it still makes me laugh. <laughs> I was certified as a first responder. So it's the, I, you know, Granted, my certification has actually expired now, and I don't really have the means to reacquire it at the moment. But um, as a first responder, should somebody have a medical emergency, my responsibility and privilege was to be the person that actually attempted to help them and, you know, basically organize the situation, get somebody to call 911 and try and figure out what's wrong and give the first steps to hopefully reduce the impact of whatever has happened as much as possible before actual medical services arrive. Now, because partially because my mother is a nurse and she is a lovely woman and has a very good understanding of exactly how easy it is to for diseases to transmit. And she gave me a small, it's called a micro shield. The whole thing is basically, it's basically a little tiny tube of sorts that you put between your mouth and the person's mouth who you're giving CPR to so that you're not lip locking them. And as I carry my keys on a uh, carabiner on my waist, partially because that makes it incredibly hard to actually leave them anywhere, I you know, decided the easiest way to make sure I did not forget it anywhere was to attach it to my keys. And Suchetta just seems to have this field day of laughter whenever this comes up. <laughs> I'm, I'm in splits right now. You should see me. Uh, do you know why? I still don't fully understand it. You said something about, oh, well, you know, I'm so organized and prepared here, but never anywhere else. Exactly. But, uh, exactly. A man who has actually forgotten a calculator to a math exam I did uh, do that once. You have done that. Uh, a man who actually left keys somewhere else has not has left the house without a wallet. So the variety of things you have done that you need to remember to remember and the precaution you took for this micro shield so you'll never forget. And the chance of that emergency ever happening in your life, which is negligible, just fascinated me. This out of proportion a commitment to something. To be fair, by that point, I actually had come up with, with ways to make sure that even if I left the house without something, I did not actually get in my car and drive away without something. True, true. Big improvement, but still not most relevant improvement. Anyways, this is so funny uh, that, that it makes me laugh, really. Thank you for reminding me that. Thank you so much, Trevor, for being on this podcast. You have given a wonderful message of hope and the clarity with which you have explained this complex deal, a hand that you were dealt. And I really appreciate your ongoing optimism and hard work. Uh, <laughs> and I'm very grateful for you eventually uh, becoming this less difficult person because it, literally you have gotten out of your own way. I'm getting there. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. And remember people, just because they're not real doesn't mean they're not after you. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at CerebralMatters.com. That's CerebralMatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.